I gave you two sheets tonight. One of them is an indication as to why we're studying the prophets. And there are a number of reasons given to you there. That's not the study tonight. It's just an extra thing. If you'd like to donate $80 to me, I'll take it. It's just extra. So I hope you can use it. There are that, Those are my reasons, I think. I don't know where I garnered them over the years. But the prophets are a great study. And, it, and Karen told me just earlier that she read them, and she said, it sounds like today. And it does, doesn't it? We're talking about doom and gloom tonight. Nahum, the prophet of doom, or Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Assyria is the one that God used to take his northern tribe, and he also, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was able to surround Jerusalem. God did not allow him at that time in history, 721 B.C., to take Jerusalem. Later on, of course, Babylon will take it under Nebuchadnezzar. But we come tonight to this little book of Nahum. And when I study the prophets, when I understand what they're doing, I understand that they're not just predicting things. They were teaching these people. They were preachers, first of all. They were trying to call the people back to the law of Moses. And the law of Moses takes precedent in their teaching. That tells me that the scrolls that Moses write were available, wrote were available to them. That they were intent on getting their people back to that which is right and good in God's sight. And something else comes to me when I study these prophets. They emphasize over and over again the sovereignty of Almighty God. God is not only in charge of Israel. He's in charge of the world. He's over all the nations. They all answer to Him. They all must keep what is taught in the Ten Commandments. So they don't have to have any either. And so he can send his prophets to them, as we're reading tonight. Here's one to a series. And he can tell them that they are going to be punished for their sins. Had they had no law from God, he could not tell them that. But certainly they did have God's sovereignty over them. God's Game of redemption had to do with all nations. Abram, you get out of your country, from your family, from your kindred, the land that I will show thee, make thee a great nation. He that blesses you, I will bless. He that curses you, I will curse. And in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. In thee and his seed. And we know from Galatians 3, 8 through 16, that the seed of Abram is Christ. And Paul insists, he didn't say the seeds as many, but to thy seed, which is Christ. The entire Bible unfolds from Genesis 12, 3 in the process that God used to bring the Messiah. And so the prophets have a great deal to tell us about this coming one. Have you ever asked yourself how it was that the Magi knew that the Messiah was coming? They were Gentiles, not Jews. I wonder how they knew the Messiah was coming. James said at the council in Jerusalem, see, we don't need to tell those Gentiles about the law of God. They have Moses read to them every Sabbath in the synagogue. They were not ignorant of the Bible. They knew what was being taught, and they'd known it for generations. Don't they trace their ancestry back to Noah? A man of God. If they didn't know it, the family was to blame. They should have been taught all these things. And the prophets bring that home to me over and over again. God is in charge of all of them. Some of my brothers and sisters haven't learned that yet. They're out here teaching that until you become a Christian, you're not under God's law. Did you know the Lord said just before He left the earth, all the authority has been given me where? Heaven and the church only, right? Now what did he say, brother and sister? Heaven and earth. He's in charge, folks. You can reject him. He'll still judge you by what he taught. John 12, 48. This is a marvelous uh, lesson for us to learn from the prophets. It profits us 
to study the prophets. And it surely does. And we come tonight to gloom and doom. Look at the second word in the text of Nahum. The burden. <laughs> of whom? Nineveh. Well, those are Assyrians, Nahum. Why are you preaching to them? Why is it a burden? Because Nineveh won't want to do it. And when you read God's law and it tells you to do something and you don't want to do it, it's a burden. It's not an easy thing to do. It becomes a weight you don't want to carry. But those of us who love the Lord, you ought to put 1 John 5, 3 right by that verse. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Now listen to John talk to somebody who loves the Lord. And His commandments are not grievous, burdensome. It's no burden to me to obey God. But if you don't want to, it's a heavy load. And look at the word he uses there. The burden of Nineveh. That's why I talk to John Manning all the time. Tell him, shape up John or it's going to be a burden, right? Can't carry that load. And every man must bear his own burden. Sometimes when it comes to obeying God, I'm on my own. Sometimes when you need help, we're all together. Every man should bear one another's burdens. But this one I carry by myself. It's my burden. I have to obey God on my own. But I can do that. I can surely do that. His commandments are not a burden to me. When you read Nahum, you should read Jonah with it. Jonah, you go to Nineveh. But when you go, you preach repentance to them. Well, I'm not going. I think I'll take a boat ride somewhere else. The Lord didn't let that happen. And Brother Wallace used to comment on Jonah being spewed out by that great fish. He said the moment Jonah hit the beach, he started running for Nineveh. That's exactly right. It's time to go preach repentance. Well, that repentance didn't last very long. Now, they're going to pay for their sins. I was asked one time, how could God condemn these nations without warning them? I said, He did warn them. Look at Genesis 15, 16. Here's the warning to all the nations. Way ahead of time. Why didn't you condemn the Amorites back then? Because their iniquity wasn't full. It wasn't time yet for him to do that. There's the warning. When your iniquity is full, it's too late. It's just too late. So Nineveh, here comes the destruction. What brought it? Her sin. This comes to them in a vision. Words in a vision. He's able to mentally see this that he's preaching. I don't know who he is. Much. It says here he's an Elkishite. I don't even know where that town is. Nobody does. We don't know where that town is. There's a guess at it. Some have surmised that this village was in Galilee, in northern Palestine. I don't know that. Capernaum means village of Nahum. That may be where it was. I don't know. Capernaum? I don't know. Maybe it is. It's on your notes there. I'm just reading my notes now. He refers to Carmel, Lebanon, and Bashan. That's in northern Israel. So this guy might be a northerner. Oh, I'm sorry. You're all southerners, aren't you? Well, I love him because I'm a Mormon. I'm a Yankee. You know, the Bible says confess your faults. I'm a Yankee. This guy's from the north, I think. There's a modern town there, El Kosek. And they thought, some think that's the former town, El Kosh, from which Nahum may have come. I don't know. If he were a native of northern Israel, then when the Assyrian monarch, Esarhaddon, brought the people into the land after he conquered it. And people call that a mongrel population. It seems to me from 2 Corinthians 17 that Nahum was one of those northerners who fled the country. Because he's still alive here to be able to pro pro prophesy to them about their destruction. Let's read 2 Kings 17. And see if that may hint at what happened here with Nahum. I can't prove this to you, but there's a hint here. 
Then the king of Assyria, that's Esarhaddon, came up throughout all the land. This is 722 B.C. Well, Isaiah's already prophesied. So is Micah. And they're mostly speaking to Judah, the southern kingdom. <coughs> and, uh, he, and besieged it three years. It took him three years to take the city of Samaria. He just surrounded it and let them starve to death or surrender. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria, carried Israel away into Assyria, and placed them in Halach and in Havor by the river Gozan in the cities of the Medes. And he repopulated Israel with his mongrel population. But some of those people fled to the south. And I noticed here in Nahum 1, 13 and 15, through 15, that in this prophecy, Nahum also addresses the south. This is Nahum 1, 13 beginning. For now will I break his yoke from off thee. That's a statement to Judah. Assyria is coming, but they're not going to be able to take you completely. God says, I will break his yoke off of you and burst the songs in sunder. And Jehovah hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown out of the house of thy gods. Will I cut off the graven image and the molten image? I will make thy grave for thou art vile. Now that's to Assyria. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good news. That publishes peace, O Judah. Judah will survive to keep her solemn peace. She will survive the invasion to perform her vows. And the wicked army of Assyria will no more pass through thee. Assyria is utterly cut off. So maybe Nahum was one of those who escaped to the south. And he is able now to prophesy. Clue to what he wrote is found in Nahum 3, verse 8. He says, Art thou better than populous? No, that's in Egypt, that was situate among the rivers, that had the rounders round about it, whose rampart was from the plus the sea, and her wall was from the sea. No woman, Thebes. This is the center for the God of Amalek and his worship. And we know from recent, or I want to say recent, last century, recent archaeological discoveries that that town was taken by Ashurbanipal, an Assyrian king, in 665 B.C. That means that when Anam is preaching to the overflow of after the overthrow of Assyria, the Nahum is right there in the time of Isaiah and lived during the reign of Judah's most wicked king, Manasseh. So when he fled south, Manasseh would have been on the throne. This prophecy only has one point. The doom of Assyria. That's it. <coughs> In Jonah, the fourth chapter, we read that Jonah had taught the Assyrians, God is slow to anger. But he does anger. And Nineveh had gone too far. That may be the most important point of this book. It is possible to store up in your life and mine, God's anger. Let's read Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. What did you say, Keith? I said it's possible to store up God's anger. I'm reading from verse 4 in Romans 2. It's on page 193. <laughs> In my Bible. Or, he's talking to the Jews here, Paul is, writing to the Jews, who thought they would escape the judgment of God because they were Jews. He said, Do you hate the riches of his goodness and his long suffering and forbearance, 
Do you not, not knowing that the goodness of God should lead you to things? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure us up, store up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. It's possible store up by staying in sin God's wrath. It never gets any better with him until I repent. The word anger in the Old Testament literally means to snort with the nose. And every time I look at that Hebrew word I think about a bull that I used to fuss with in the old pasture. And he did not like me. I think he could see me coming even around the corner of the barn. He could smell me or something and he'd start pawing the ground. And he'd put his head down. And he'd shake that head. And he'd start snorting. And the closer I got, I'd take my shirt off and wave it at him. Ah! And he'd start snorting. And he'd paw the ground. And he'd snort some more. And had there not been a fence between me and him, <laughs> I just stored up his anger. For all I know, he's probably dead now, I'm sure. But if he weren't, he'd still be angry at me. God's anger is like that. He snorts with me. And he keeps snorting more and more the longer I stay in sin. He gets angrier and angrier and angrier. I want you to stand with him now in the temple. Are you ready? You're in the temple and Jesus is God. He's in the temple. And he's got these little pieces of leather that they use to drive the animals for their sacrifice, the Jews. And he's weaving a whip. And he's standing over in that corner and he's watching the <coughs> Jews sitting at tables, charging their fellow Jews for exchanging the Roman denarii in their pockets for the Hebrew shackle that they must have to go into the temple by the animal. The law of Moses said they were not allowed to do that to their brother Jews. So he's standing there watching his own people violate his law. And he's weaving that whip. And he exploded. And the tables went flying. And he said, you turn my father's house of worship into a house of merchandise, just as the prophet had predicted. Mm -hmm. The key to Nahum's prophecy is in that word. Look at verse 3. The, verse chapter 1. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Watch this line. And will not at all acquit the wicked. I'm not fond of thinking about this part of God's nature for you. We love to hear about His love. That's, I love to hear that too. I just love it. His grace, His long suffering, His forbearance. But sometimes we use that to excuse our sin. <laughs> I'm asked all the time, how's the school going? We're doing all right. Why don't they ask me how God is blessing us? Because if it weren't for His blessings, we wouldn't be a school. We wouldn't be a congregation. We wouldn't be anything. There's nothing to brag about in this work in terms of what we're doing. But there's a whole lot to say about the fact that He wanted to hear and you could have it's his business. I have to be careful not to be so proud of my work that I lose my soul. Because God does that for me. 
Without him, I'm nothing. And I do not want to live in such a way that one day I'll hear that nose snorting. Do you? Paul said it this way. He said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Wow, we persuade men. I'd like to avoid that thought, but I can't. And then the Hebrews writer said, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God and not prepared to go there. Did you ever stop to think that nobody who is living as a human being has ever seen God yet? Well, look at John 1, 18. <laughs> no man has seen the Father at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom, when John writes that, He's up in heaven. He hath declared <laughs> We're also told by Paul that as he wrote to Timothy that the Christ dwells in the light unto which no man can approach. I can't walk up to God and say, please save me. I've got to go through Jesus. You can't go to God through anyone but Christ. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There isn't a human being that can say, now God, you saved me. Wait a minute, you better go through Jesus. Otherwise, you'll never be introduced to God. Neither will I. Let's talk to Job a moment see if I can make this point clear for us. Job, what's your problem? He said, I need a redeemer, kinsman. I need a go -well. I need somebody to talk to God for me. Because I don't know why all this is happening. I'm suffering and I don't even know why it's happening. But Job, I can tell you why I read your book. <coughs> Satan accused God of being unrighteous and for protecting you. And so there was a battle on now. Well, I need a lawyer in heaven. I'm sorry. You won't be here until a little bit later in history, Job. You're 1,500 years too early. I'm so grateful I live on this side of the cross because I've got a lawyer in heaven. His name is Jesus. He's my advocate. And he'll argue my case with anybody, even Satan. So why would I want to make him angry? He's on my side. He is. Look at 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Our advocate. My little children, these things right under you is sin not. But if any man sin, we have an paracletos, a lawyer in heaven. Jesus Christ the righteous. If somebody were to go to God like Satan and say, you know that key, the only reason he follows you is you protect him. The Lord, the Father in heaven would say, you better take that up to his lawyer. Job, Job didn't have it. And when you read the book of Job, it's all right to feel sorry for him. He doesn't have a redeemer kinsman yet. But he said this, I know that my redeemer lives and shall stand in the latter days upon the earth. How do you know that, Job? God told him. Job 19, 25. But Nahum comes to a people who not, not only don't love God, they enjoy killing God's people. And God said, that's enough. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of His feet. He rebuketh the sea and makes it dry. That's a reference to the crossing of the Red Sea. Of the Red sea. And dries up all the rivers. Bashan languishes and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languishes. Yes, Assyria overran those towns. But the mountains quake at God and the hills melt. That's a reference to idolatry and human governments. When you read the word mountain in the prophets, that's a human government. When you read the word hill, that's the hill of idolatry where they worship Baal and his astros and all of those. And the earth is burned at his presence. You remember when Isaiah said the kingdom would come? It would be over the mountains and over the hills. What he's talking about. The kingdom of God is over all people and over all idolatry. God's in charge. And He's in charge of the world and all that dwell therein. Nahum, how come there's no back on my sheet? Did you all miss one? Do you have a back on here? Back on here? Here's your lesson. <laughs> Or you're just outlined. It's very easily outlined. 
three, three, three verses, three ideas. Chapter one, then it was doomed. Chapter two, then it was doomed to describe, or declared, then it was doomed to describe. Chapter three, we learned that then it deserved. When you read the problems, you will read over and over again God's method of reaching people. It's always the same. In fact, it's how Jesus did it. God will tell them that He desired to save them. When Isaiah preached to Judah, he said, here's your problem. Come now, let us reason together. God always has desire to save man. But man has a part in this and man's <coughs> future depends on the decision that man makes. So God expresses His desire, come unto me. What decision will I make? Because the decision will decide whether I have delight or a disaster. And it happens over and over again in the prophets and in the scriptures. God says, come. Man says, no. Disaster. God says, come. Man says, yes. Delight. And Nineveh did not listen. She repented for a season, but she forgot the lesson. I want you to note something. Look at Nahum 112. Serious students of the Bible. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet. That should read, though Assyria thinks she's very strong. I don't know how they translated it that way, but they missed it. Though Assyria thinks she's very strong and large, many, he says, God will succeed seed anyway. Assyria is not big enough to fight God. So as uh, Nahum 1, 2 prophets about what God can do. Then look at 2, 2. Here again, it says, For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob. I wouldn't do that. It should be, shall bring again the excellency of Judah. God didn't allow Assyria to turn away Judah. He brought her back again. And that's what the verse reads if you want to make a mark in your Bible. In the Hebrew, it shall bring again. Her return will occur. Nineveh was not just one city. It was four. Around each section of that were 100 foot walls. Was she strong? How high is 100 feet? What's that? 25, 30, what? 30 or 40? 25. We'll multiply that by two and a half. That's protection. They can't take us. Each one of those sections had 100 feet walls around it. And they were wide. They were so wide you could drive four chariots side by side across the top. 100 feet high. The city covered 350 square miles. That's about the size of London, modern London. That's a big city. Four defenses, really. Look at Jonah 4.11 there, as he talks about the city. And in that, within the city is where they grew their crops, where they kept their flocks. So if a siege occurred, they didn't worry about it. Got my garden here, my animal. They thought they were so strong, nothing could happen to them. But she was so vile, God decided to end it. The Assyrians loved savagery, blood. What they loved to do to their victims was skin them alive. They flayed them. That was a big sport for the Assyrians. They loved to watch, uh, let you watch them kill your children by bashing the children's heads against a wall and then they would put out your eyes so that would be the last thing you'd ever see. They like to stick a pole through the chest of the victim, carry him around that way until he died. You think it's time for God to step in? They like to rip out your tongue, and then things too often mentioned that I won't even talk about. These people were butchers. And yet, God gave them a chance in their history to repent. 
Now it's too, it's, it's gone too far. If you want to know if a man's a true prophet, just ask yourself, did his prophecy come to pass? And it did. Oh my. Daniel talked to a king named Nebuchadnezzar who had a dream. And the Nebuchadnezzar found out that his empire was one of four involved in the bringing of Messiah. And interestingly, the way Assyria was defeated was by one of its own generals. His name was Nebuchadnezzar, but he was actually a Babylonian. And he had a son named Nebuchadnezzar. And together, they took that city, and people can't even tell where it is today. They tore that great big 350 square mile city to the ground. And the irony of studying this book is so strange to me. How many of you know what name's main name means? But it's on my sheet there. Comfort. What? You're a doom and gloom preacher and your name is Comfort? <coughs> well, it's comforting to me to know that God takes care of the wicked. Is it comforting to you? John, you shook your head yes. Could you read for us tonight? Would you find Luke 18, 7 and 8? Which one of the students will find Revelation 6, 10 and 11? Can you find it? Okay. Can you find Revelation 12, 19? Okay. Somebody read Luke 18, 7 and 8. And shall not God avenge his own elect? Yes, sir, he will. Which cry day and night unto him, though he bear along with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Will God avenge his own elect? Yes, sir. He's on our side. Revelation 6, 10, 11. What are they crying, Cain? They cry for my voice, saying, How long? How long is this going to happen, Lord? Are you ever going to end it? How long, O Lord, will we intrude, lest I not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? How long, God? The Saturday before Philip Manuel died. I was talking to him on the phone. He said, Brother Keith, why can't I go home? How long is this going to happen? I said, I don't know the time, Philip, but I know the God you serve. Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for his written vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Nineveh represents his present evil world. And she's headed for doom because she won't re repent. When you get a chance, you want to see what the Assyrians were like, just read Isaiah chapter 36 and meet the Rav Shaki. And when you see that name, that, those were, that word, it's not a name. It's like saying you meet the general of the Assyrian army. You meet the Rav Shaki. And he will stand outside of Jerusalem and tell Jerusalem what he's going to do to them. And the envoys from Hezekiah come out and say, could you talk in the Hebrew language? Our people speak Aramaic and they don't understand that. We don't like what you're saying. We don't want you to hear it. He just yells louder. And he just tries to insult them and insult them and insult them. And what he doesn't know is the more money he's going to be dead. And when I read that, I just laugh at the old Rav Shakib. Because he's messing with the wrong God. His idea of God is he's a city God. I can take him. Look at all the cities I've taken. And all the time, he's storing up the wrath of God. It comes down. Haman, there's a man in our society who did great things for me. How should we honor him? Haman thinks he's talking about me. It was Mordecai. And Haman had to lead that horse around, didn't he? And everybody was yelling, praise to Mordecai, and all that kind of thing. And I laugh every time I think about Haman. Not because of the way he ended up, but because of the God who takes care of people like that. Haman stirred up God's wrath. Haman built the gallows to hang Mordecai. You know where Haman was on? On the gallows he built to Mordecai. Oh, the Bible is replete with how God deals with the wicked. I trust there's no one here tonight who is storing up God's wrath. 
But if you are, in a moment, we're going to offer the invitation. It's the nice tonight to take care of it. Please don't walk out of that door tonight knowing that God's angry with you. That's a dangerous place to put yourself. Are you trying to ring the bell out there? Oh, they run it twice? Well, shut up, Keith. 